Lord Jesus, we honor you today. We welcome your presence. We ask, Lord, that you'd grip our hearts, that you'd release faith. Lord, in the midst of the, this difficult time in our nation where people are out of work, people are struggling, we ask, Lord, that you would come in your great power. Push this sickness back in Jesus' name. We command you to die and let go of our land. Lord, bring awakening to the church. Draw our families to you. And Lord, change us today for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. It's good to be with you, even if it's online today. I've missed all of my church family. I've missed my own kids and grandkids. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your prayer life. We are a praying church. I urge you to pray for our nation, our president, our governor. Pray for our city officials. Pray for companies and businesses. But most of all, pray for revival, that God will get our hearts Thank you for your consistent giving. We appreciate it so very much. And Lord, uh, we are waiting and eager for the time we come out of this better and stronger. Uh, we will study the word. will be in Acts chapter 12 uh, today. And you can download uh, that outline if you want to follow me and take notes. We're talking today about how much faith... Does it take? Well, how much faith does it take for what? Well, I just want to ask you some questions about faith. Uh, can you define it in a sentence? What has been your faith level in the last four or five weeks? Has it been increasing or decreasing? Faith is kind of like uh, one of the tires on our zero-turn mower at home over the winter time. It developed a air leak. I don't know if there's the seal has broken or what, but every time we mow, we have to go out there and pump that thing up. And uh, uh, faith is like that too. Faith never stays constant. And we go through life, we have setbacks, we have disappointments, we have things that break our heart. And just frankly, just living life, drains our faith. So that, therefore, faith has to be replenished. Now, I want to give you some things that will help you as you try to understand faith, and faith is how we deal with God. Here's my simple definition of faith. Faith is believing what God said. If God said it, that's good enough for me. Faith is also a partnership. So as we talk about faith, you and I have two invitations. One, will we believe what God said? Two, will we enter into a partnership with him every day because he's looking for partners? And if he's not my partner, I can't do what he wants me to do. Matter of fact, on my very best day, I only bring 2% to the table. I need his 98%. So, without him, I cannot. And this is, uh, this is in the realm of the mysterious. But apparently, he looks for human partners. Because without us, it seems like he will not. The scripture says he looked for a man to stand in the gap that he would not bring destruction upon it, the, the land of his people. But guess what? He couldn't find one. So a lot of the ills in our families and in our cities and our nation is because he can't find partners. We should say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Now, the enemy wants to destroy our faith because if he steals our faith, if we're not able to feed our faith, what happens is we become less effective and we fall away from him. So the enemy wants to steal our faith, but God constantly wants to build our faith. 
Now, I want to give you some comparisons. If you and I are in a partnership with the Almighty, there are some things I supply, and there are some things that He supply. Well, like what? I supply my need. Here's a young lad that had two fish and five loaves, and they were going to feed 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people. You know what? That's a great need. And I'm going to guess today you have needs that are not being met. Well, take that need to him, and then what he supplies is his compassion and his provision. Next, we supply our trust. The Scripture says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I want to take my faith and turn to him to meet my need. I want to place my trust, even when I don't understand, I want to say to him, Lord, I trust you. I'm looking for his power to come. It wasn't there yesterday, may not be there today, but I'm looking for it tomorrow. And then I take my little bit. I take what I can do, I can take what I give, and I offer it to him as a pleasing sacrifice, and then he takes my small offering, and he brings his abundance to the table, and I'm so very grateful. And last, I take my obedience. Because if I have a need, he's got a plan. And as he speaks to me, I need to step out in faith and do what he asked me to do. Now, there's a famine in Israel. And the man of God, Elijah, was sent to a woman who was slowly perishing from the famine. And she had a child, and that child was dying, and they didn't have enough food. And when Elijah came to their town... When he came up to where she was, she was making a little bit of bread with flour and a little bit of olive oil, and he said a very strange thing. He said, give me something to eat. She said, give you something to eat. I don't have enough for my family. He said, if you will feed me first, God will meet your need, and the miracle did happen. The oil kept growing and growing and growing until she not only had her need met, but she paid off all of her debts. Now, as we talk today, I want to go through three stories that just illustrate how much faith does it take to move the hand of God. So, if you have just this much faith, you can see God move in your life. Now, my mother, when I was a kid growing up, had a little necklace, a little glass necklace, kind of like a pearl drop kind of um, configuration, and inside that was a tiny mustard seed that you could barely even see. And I used to ask my mother, tell me about that. And Jesus said, if you had just enough faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could see God move in your life, and I never forgot that. So the first of the three things that if you have any of them, you can see God move. And the first one is that you are willing to pray. If you're able, willing, and will pray, you have enough faith. And let's read this story. Turn with me to Acts 12. And it says, About the time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw it pleased the Jews, he he proceeded to arrest Peter, and it was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers that showed you how much he was feared, to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison. Look at the very next phrase in your Bible. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. We are praying church, and we are moving to become a house of prayer, a house that centers prayer in everything. Verse 6. On that very night, 
When Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains with guards in front of the door who were watching over the prison. And an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off of his hands. Can you imagine that? The angel said, gird yourself. In other words, put on your clothes, put on your sandals, and he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. So he went out and continued to follow. He did not know if what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he might even be seeing a vision or having a dream. And when they passed the first and second gate, they came in the iron gate, that leads into the city, and that gate opened for them by itself. They went out and went along on this street, and then the angel departed. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Wow, I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary the mother of John, who was also called Mark, and that's the one that wrote the book of Mark, where many were gathered together, and again it says twice they were praying. He knocked at the door of the gate. A servant girl by the name of Rhoda came to answer, and when she recognized Peter's voice, because her joy, she did not open the gate. In other words, she went, oh my, he's here. But she didn't open the gate, and she ran back in to tell the others. When she got to where people were praying, in the middle of the prayer meeting, verse 15, here's what they said in prayer. Praise God, the Lord has answered our prayer. We knew he was coming even tonight. No, that's not what they said. Look at what they said. You're out of your mind, girl. But she kept insisting, no, he's out there. And they kept saying, no, it's probably his angel, his spirit, his ghost. Herod's probably already killed him. And Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were amazed. Now, from this story, there's several principles. One is the most powerful, most powerful position on the face of the earth It's not in the governor's mansion. It's not in the White House. It's not in Congress. It's not in Hollywood. It's not in New York City. It's praying before the throne of God. And I want to encourage you. Keep praying. Never give up. If you have enough faith to just keep praying, Keep praying no matter how loud the doubts scream in your head. And I want to give you another assurance that the Heavenly Father hears His obedient children every single time we pray. I remember years ago walking in front of my house in my subdivision And it was one of those prayer times, you've had them too, where it just didn't seem like you were getting through, you didn't seem close, you were kind of lethargic, you thought you were praying, going through the motion. And in the midst of kind of discouragement, the sweet, still, small voice of God's Spirit said, Steve, I want you to remember I heard you today, and I want you to know I always hear you. Whether you feel like it or not, I always hear you. What an encouragement. Now, going back to the story, I love Legos. In Lego land story, here Peter is in the inner part of the prison there in Jerusalem. We have the church praying and interceding. And by the way, it, it's actually a good principle that when you pray to expect the answer. It's a good principle. Just learn to do that. If you pray, expect the answer to come. And uh, this angel came in. I love this figure. He takes his sword and bumps Peter and wakes him up and says, get up, get up. 
put your clothes on. So he gets up. The angel leads him out into the street. The gates open. Peter finds himself in front of the house of John Mark, who I think is probably his cousin. And he's knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And Rhoda, this, this sweet girl, I don't know how she is, she comes to the door. She opens a peephole and says, ah, it's Peter. But she closes the peephole and runs back in. She doesn't open up. And he still thinks his life is in danger. And she says, it's Peter, it's Peter, it's Peter. And the praying saints tell her, you are absolutely crazy. (laughs) And she said, no, well, prove it. And so she goes and opens the door and brings him in. You know what? There's been so many times that I prayed, and I had no faith to see the prayer answered The scripture says that when we do pray, it says, truly I say to you, all things, not some things, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and it shall be granted to you. I'll never forget Sunday, our last service was over and uh, oh, I was so tired. It had been such a long week. I was so depleted. I had no energy. I had no faith. I had no compassion. And I had all my stuff, and I was going to my office, and this family said, Pastor Steve, Pastor Steve. And I turned around, and I said, <laughs> I'm not near as holy as any of you think I am. And as they came, I said, I said to my, I said, oh, great, can I help you? Inside, I was going, oh, no. And so they came up, and they said, our daughter has got this huge growth inside her nostrils, And we're having it cut out tomorrow. And she is so afraid. And you could see the growth in her nose. It was horrible. And she said, our daughter just wants you to pray and use your faith to pray and see if God won't heal her and touch her so she won't have to have this horrible surgery. I tell you what, I was so discouraged. I was like that flat tire on our mower. I just went, oh, no. But I just did it by rote. I got some oil. I went over to that little girl. I said, let's lay hands on her. I put a drop of oil on her forehead. I prayed a 18-second faithless prayer. <laughs> and I hugged three people, and I walked out the door. I felt so dejected. I felt like such a spiritual loser. But the very next week, that same family came up, and they said, Pastor Steve, we got to tell you what happened. And I went, uh-oh, they're going to blame me for something. <laughs> and she said, our daughter was brushing her teeth on Monday morning before we went. And all of a sudden, she felt something in the back of her throat. And she started gagging, and she coughed it out, and it was that growth, that tumor just fell out of her nasal passage. And you know what? The little girl said, I believe. And dad said, I believe. And mom said, I believe. And I went, I believe too. (laughs) So thank you for helping my unbelief. So if you just have enough faith to pray, just pray. What do you have to lose? Do it. And then the second story is if you have enough faith simply to obey Turn over to Luke chapter 5, verse 1. The scripture says, It happened that while the crowd was pressing in and listening to the word of God, that Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had gotten out of them, and they were washing or cleaning their nets. And he got into the one of the boats, which was Simon Peter's, and he asked him, Would you please push it out a little way from the land? And he sat down and he began to teach the people from the boat. And after he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, By the way, when you serve Jesus in the smallest thing, Jesus always notices. He said, What I want you to do is push out into the deep water Let down your nets for a catch. And Peter answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night. We caught nothing. 
he went on to imply, I think he rolled his surly eyes and said, you know what, this guy is a carpenter. I like him. I love him. Pretty awesome. But what does he know about fishing? You don't catch fish during the day. We're professional fishermen. I've done this for 25 years. What does he know? But then he didn't say what he thought. I've said what I thought, but he didn't say what he thought. But instead he said, nevertheless, I will do what you say and let down the nets. You know what faith says? Faith says don't listen to the doubt in your head. Don't listen to it. Instead, listen to what Jesus told you to do. It doesn't matter what your head says. Do what you feel like he's spoken to your heart. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and the net began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boats for them to come and help them. And when they came, they filled both of the boats So the boats were about to sink. And when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Lord, I think it's best if you just go away from me because I'm a pretty sinful guy because of my heart. Can I ask you a really hard question? People say they have faith. People Even say they have great faith. Well, how would you know if a person actually does have faith? There's really only one way. What is it? Your faith is only exhibited if you are acting out your faith by doing what he asks you to do. That's the only way to know you have faith if you're doing what he asks you to do. You see, faith is not a feeling. Faith is a belief that motivates you to do even what you're afraid to do, even what you think will not work. Faith is only evident when you're actually doing something. The brother of our Savior, James, said this, faith without works is, you know what the rest of it says? Dead. He says, you say you have faith? James says, show me your faith by what you're doing, by your works. Now, years ago, I'd been a Christian only six or seven months, and I grew up near this lake, Hartwell Lake. It's a huge lake. Matter of fact, it is the biggest lake in the entire southeast portion of the U.S. And uh, you look on this map, if you can see the Blue River Up there on the northwest side, Lake Hartwell is the boundary between Georgia and northern South Carolina. It's actually the Savannah River that goes all the way down to Savannah, Georgia. It was dammed up about 1960. So great place for boating, fishing, camping. A lot of beautiful homes are on Lake Hartwell. It's probably 100, 150 miles long. Well, I'd only been a Christian for five, six, seven months, and I got an invitation by one of my friends, one of my neighbors that I'd played ball with and known all of his life. He had just graduated from Paris Island as a brand-new Marine. He was getting married to another one of our high school classmates, and he's saying, I'm having a bachelor party, and I want you to go. And let me tell you what, I did not want to go. Do you know what bachelor parties for a bunch of young Marines are like? It's nothing healthy or pretty, but I felt like I had to go, so I went. And I want to tell you, things got rowdy. There was a lot of drinking, a lot of carrying on, and things got really bad about midnight. Uh, The class nerd was a guy named Alton, and everybody decided they would take Alton put him on their shoulders, run him down the hill, and throw him into Lake Hartwell. And that's exactly what they did. I mean, I actually helped. And we all laughed about it, and Alton came out of the dark, 
cold Hartwell Lake. He came back up to where the campsite, where the bonfire was, and he was sputtering wet. He was cold, and he was yelling. He said, you idiot, you threw me into the lake. And my parents spent $300 on brand new glasses, and now they're gone. You idiot. Well, all of us friends, and we were friends, we felt bad. We went down the hill at midnight, and we got in Hartwell Lake, and you're crazy to think you're going to find a pair of glasses at midnight in Hartwell Lake. So all of us were out there after 20 minutes. All 20 people gave up, these rowdy Marines, and it was only Alton and I. We were the only ones in the lake. The water is up about to my chest. I'd only been a Christian a few months, and I heard the voice of God. I didn't didn't know what it was. Speak to my spirit. And the voice just said this, stoop down in the water. I thought, what? Did I just say that to myself? Stoop down in the water? But I didn't know any better than just to obey. So I'm a tall boy, so I just kind of stoop down in the water, and I go, well, what's next? Open your right hand. So I didn't know any better. I opened my right hand, and then the voice to my spirit said a third thing. Now close your right hand. I didn't feel a thing in my right hand. I walked out of the water, and guess what I found in my right hand? Alton's glasses were in my right hand. It was a miracle. I could not believe what had just happened. But I said to myself, and I said to those Marines, there is a true and living God, and he cares about things, even glasses. If you have faith enough to pray, you have enough faith. If you have faith enough to obey, you have enough faith. And one last story, turn to the left It's a great story. It's a hard story. It is not an easy passage. Matthew chapter 15, starting at verse 21. I want you to follow this. Jesus went away from there, and he withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. That is today Lebanon. And a Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman, a pagan woman from the region there came and she began to cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. Son of David, she recognized he was the Jewish Messiah. And let me tell you why the next phrase tells you why she's so upset. She is yelling at the top of her voice. She says, my daughter, It's cruelly demon-possessed. Now, you would think that Jesus always helps everybody who asks, and I think that, and I believe that. I believe he'll run across heaven to help people. But the odd thing in the next verse, verse 29, he didn't even answer her. He just kept walking because he was on a mission, and he ignored her. And the disciples came up. They're such compassionate men. They all went to Asbury Seminary. And they said, Lord, please help this woman. We love her so much. And we know you're so compassionate you can do anything. Did they say that? Did these called holy men of God say that? No. They said, would you tell her to shut up? Would you tell her to get out of her face? She is embarrassing us. We don't have time for this. Have you ever done people that way? And then Jesus finally answered and said, excuse me, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. By the way, I would just say, everybody that walks in victory Everybody that walks in strong faith, you know what? They have doubts too. Doubts are not a sin. 
If you let them stop you, they become a sin. Now, what did Jesus mean by saying, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Here's what he meant. The Father has given me a task and a mission, and I'm to stay on that task. I was sent to the people of Israel, and I'm sorry, that's all I can help. And then she said this, Lord, three words, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Worship team, you guys come on up. Lord, help me. Is that a powerful prayer? There's sometimes I have been so upset, so broken, so discouraged. All I could say was, Lord, help me. And then Jesus said something that's really hard, really puzzling, and I can talk more about this later. And he said, It's good, it is not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. He is kind of giving the cultural setting of Judaism who feel like Gentiles are not worth helping. But I don't think that's what Jesus meant. You ever had somebody say, come and then push you back at the same time? push you back and say, come at the same time. I think Jesus is pushing back on her to see if she's willing to persist. And I think that's what heaven does with us sometimes. Heaven pushes back or heaven is silent to see if we will keep praying, to see if we will obey, and to see if we will stay. Don't let your doubts stop you. Keep praying. And then the woman said one of the most amazing things in all the New Testament. Do you read what she says? She says, yes, Lord, I agree. I am technically outside of the Father's plan for the chosen people at this point. But she said, even the little dogs under the master's table get the crumbs. How about a crumb, Lord? Just a crumb. And here's what he said. I pray he'd say this about me. I pray he'd say it about you. He said, oh, woman, your faith is so great. It shall be done to you as you have wished. And that daughter was freed at that very moment. Now here's what your pastor does when things don't turn out. And often it doesn't turn out the way I pray. It doesn't turn out the way I hope. It doesn't turn out the way I wish or even believing at the time. And when that happens, now here's my counsel to you. When it doesn't turn out the way I hope it would, I say this, because I don't understand everything. I just say, Lord, I want to tell you, even though it didn't turn out the way I wanted, I want to say I still trust you. And I trust you that you know what's best all the time. I want to pray for you right now because I believe you're watching because the Lord wants to build your faith. He wants to help you. Maybe you have a huge need and you only have this much resource. Let's take that to him. Are you willing to offer that to him? Are you willing to obey him? Are you willing to stay steadfast in prayer until that son comes back to God? Until you get the job you need? Until you get your debts paid off? Until the healing comes to your body? Let me pray for you. 
Lord Jesus, I lift up everyone that's watching right now and that will watch this over the coming weeks and months. I release faith in the room where they are. I bind unbelief and fear in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray. I pray for your provision, your power, and your might. And for anyone in this room listening that's not right with God today, I ask you to pray with me. Take the little amount of faith that you have and make a choice. Believe on the Word of God. Surrender your life to Christ right now. Pray with me as you watch and say, Lord Jesus, I need you badly. Come into my life and change me forever. I give you my life and I will serve you. Increase my faith in Jesus' name. Amen.